thank you very much, uh, Professor Elbaz, uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, let me congratulate you and your uh, team for uh, achieving this uh, successful event, hopefully to be with you uh, every year. Looking at this diagram, uh, one can realize that the kidney is at the center or core of interactions with various organs of the body. Uh, particularly to my interest today, that I'm going to discuss this relationship in a little bit of detail, the kidney and the lung, how they interact, or let me say, the state of crosstalk. Everybody realizes the pulmonary renal syndromes that are affecting the lungs and the kidneys at the same time. These rare diseases, which are vasculitic in nature, lead to alveolar lung hemorrhage as well as glomerulopathies that may progress to crescentic forms, causing as well hematuria and AKI. Since a long time, the nomenclature of pulmonary syndromes was in the form of uh, eponyms, and this form of nomenclature has recently been changed into more descriptive nomenclature, such as granulomatosis with polyangitis and no longer Friedreich's uh, uh, or Wegner's granulomatosis. Uh, of particular interest, this particular nomenclature was uh, denounced in the year 2011 because uh, uh, Professor Wegner was found to have ties with the Nazis in 1945. There are numerous other pulmonary interactions, pulmonary renal interactions, but have not yet been uh, well described. So uh, I plan this uh, outline of my talk to show how these relationships exist and starting by showing you how the lung and kidney are intimate uh, together. And this intimacy, as a matter of fact, is based on similarities like I'm going to show you now. In this diagram, you can realize that the basement membrane of the glomerulus and of the alveoli share the same structure regarding the type of collagen, laminins, and proteoglycans. And both of these membranes uh, actually function as a selective filtration barrier, whether for fluids and macromolecules in the kidneys or for gases uh, uh, diffusing across the basement membrane of uh, the alveoli in case of the lung. Uh, taking a closer microsc microscope look at the structure, you can find also that the epithelial sodium channels are similar whether for the alveolar membranes and for the kidneys, and both of them share equal numbers of all the aquaporins. All seven of them are represented and present, uh, whether in the basement membrane of the kidney or the alveoli. So this is another very important uh, similarity, meaning that pathologies affecting this organ could in the same way affect the other. Taking you even further to the intrauterine life, I will show you more. But we have to realize that the lung and kidney intimacy is related to these uh, common uh, functions that both kidneys and lung are uh, taking care of uh, during everyday uh, activities. So taking you back to gestational period to show you this intimacy has a long background. It starts by the amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid has the fetal urine, and this fetal urine is a very important source of proline. Proline is definitely needed for the maturation of the pulmonary parenchyma, and those uh, uh, fetuses that are born with renal agenesis or hypoplasia uh, or uh, congenital bilateral renal dysplasia suffer as well from pulmonary hypoplasia and this is happening due to the reduced amount of proline. So the story starts uh, when uh, the human being is in triuterine. How can the kidney and lung pathologically interact together? And looking at this diagram, let me start by taking you here. If we have a state of AKI, 
There's a lot of mediators secreted from the renal tubules and a lot of exudative stress and retention of uremic toxins, particularly uh, P. chrysol or chrysyl, if you wish to pronounce it that way, and induxyl sulfate, both of which are very injurious to the capillaries of the lung, leading to increased vascular permeability, and definitely they would dysregulate the sodium and water channels, leading to a lot of fluids barging into the alveolar spaces and actually acute lung injuries happening. If initially the condition started by an acute lung injury, like in other respiratory distress, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, for example, again, uh, the patient may suffer from hypoxia, which could lead to embarrassment of the GFR, hypercapnia, various increase in intra-abdominal pressure related to positive end expiratory pressure of the patient needs ventilation, and eventually these patients will also suffer from AKI. So it goes round and round, whether from this side or the other. We have to realize that AKI is something serious and is happening quite often in the intensive care, and there is a variability in the incidence related to specific centers, how they diagnose and the type of morbidities they see. So AKI in the ICU is something not uncommon, particularly for patients who need assisted ventilation. Uh, you can see from here that the COPD patients needing ventilation have a mortality rate as high as 26 percent, and patients with ARDS uh, could have a rate of mortality up to 66 percent. We're not using this term anymore, and it is antiquated, uh, and has fallen into disuse yet, still it is very uh, much descriptive of what is happening, the classic bats wing shadows, as you can see in the photomicrograph here. Patients with this form of injury have respiratory insufficiency uh, associated with vascular congestion, leukocytic infiltration, and a lot of hemorrhagic alveolitis. Patients with uh, this form of uremic lung uh, under the effect of the uremic toxins, uh, as I said before, the induxyl sulfate and picrisol uh, would need uh, eventually uh, a renal replacement therapy. Looking at this diagram, and let me draw a line to show you if, again, the injury is starting in the lung, acute lung injury, patients could suffer hypoxia, hypercapnia, a lot of inflammatory mediators, all would lead to AKI, and if the patient on the other side started by AKI, resultant uremic toxins would affect the lung causing inflammation and acute lung injury. The tubular damage itself is releasing a lot of inflammatory mediators, and naturally we all understand that a failing kidney is uh, associated with salt and water retention, which is a state of fluid overload, leading to pulmonary congestion and edema, again, acute lung injury. So it is a, 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 a bidirectional relationship, as I showed you. But if we look at the renal-induced lung damage in, uh, uh, in particular, we can find that uh, pul uh, pulmonary edema, respiratory failure, heart failure, and even immunoparalysis could result uh, from kidney-induced uh, lung damage. And we have to understand and realize that the renal tubular epithelium is the major site uh, for a secretion of the lot of the inflammatory mediators, and naturally the lung with such uh, an extensive capillary network is so much susceptible to injury by these uh, mediators. So looking at this diagram and this side in particular, this is the tubules. Looking here, we can find that glomerular injury, again, which is another part of the kidney, could be associated with uh, lung injury uh, due to the increase in circulating interleukin-6 that interleukin that is being measured in cases of COVID to decide on giving uh, the specific monoclonal antibody or not. So this interleukin-6 uh, is something uh, uh, serious and secreted from the injured glomeruli uh, together with a lot of leukocyte trafficking that's leading to various uh, inflammation 
uh, affecting the permeability of the vasculature of uh, the lung and all this is related to glomerular injury. How about the kidney lung cross token a specific disease such as the acute respiratory artery distress syndrome? We're seeing a lot of this nowadays. It is common with infections, serious infections, and particularly with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. A lot of patients uh, that are debilitated or have comorbidity or severe diseases are suffering from ARDS, which is a real burden and has and shows a very high rate of mortality. And typically, these patients are also suffering from AKI. Not only the pro-inflammatory mediators and the cytokines and interleukin-6 that are causing damage, but recently it has been shown and now it is realized that the damaged mitochondria are secreting uh, what is known as DAMPs, damage-associated uh, <clears throat> molecular patterns. These types of molecules or proteins are coming out of the damaged powerhouses of the cells and are leading to serious uh, injuries uh, to the lung following states of AKI or renal uh, induced uh, perfusion, ischemic perfusion injuries. And this has been uh, published uh, recently uh, in this journal uh, with that mentioned possibly uh, directing therapies towards this particular point uh, may be uh, of help. Another clinical scenario is the patients who have uh, obstructive sleep apnea or COPD and naturally these patients when they are uh, in a serious condition they would need mechanical ventilation again through these various mechanisms uh, AKI is not uncommon uh, due to barotrauma, heart failure uh, resultant hypercapnia and hypoxia, all of which will lead to hypoperfusion of the kidney and a failing kidney is the resultant endpoint. Uh, being uh, during uh, this COVID uh, pandemic, it's why I have to say a few words about the COVID and the kidney. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of what COVID is doing to the kidneys and that uh, once this terrible virus sticks to its ligand. Uh, a lot of disturbances are happening, uh, particularly at the immune system. And this recent publication shows you how uh, AKI is such a serious problem for some of patients, some of patients uh, having this form of uh, infection. But I'm interested in a certain point which is related to the long COVID syndrome. Those patients who suffer from unpleasant symptoms passing a period of 28 days, foggy, foggy minds, back aches, diarrhea, a shortness of breath, even if a patient had a mild infection and suffers for more than 20 days, he is classified as being a long hauler. The point is, such patients, the long haulers, the COVID long haulers, such patients were found to have a higher risk of development of chronic kidney disease, not only chronic kidney disease, but uh, polyneuropathy and even CNS affection has been reported. Uh, I'm pointing to this uh, finding uh, to uh, aware you that such patients with long COVID have to be regularly checked for the renal functions for the possibility of the development of chronic kidney disease even if the infection is mild, even if the patient was young. Of course, if older, with morbidities or a severer form of infection, the possibilities are higher. And this has been published lately uh, in Jason just last November. They didn't understand why this is happening, but lately uh, it has been uh, understood why it is happening, we understand that once the virus uh, attaches by its spike protein to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh, receptor, a lot of disruption of the immune system is happening because this receptor uh, is very important or this enzyme is very important for the duration of the immune system. So uh, this binding uh, is disrupting the immune system. Uh, lately, 
And just last February, a very interesting uh, finding uh, I want to share with you. This particular antibody related to the infection, as all antibodies are cleared by another antibody produced from the body, known as the anti-idiotype. This particular anti-idiotype for the COVID uh, virus antibody is actually a mirror image of the virus. And it keeps on sticking to the receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme to uh, receptor and continues disrupting the immune system and now there is research in this regard to clear this antibody that is now understood is responsible about the long haulers or long COVID symptoms. The last point I'm addressing today is the kidney during mechanical ventilation. We know that patients on the mechanical ventilation uh, suffer a lot from AKI and mortalities could reach 60% and the kidney during mechanical ventilation could be affected in various ways such as the decrements of renal blood flow affecting the GFR and the sodium excretion resulting in a lot of salt and water retention and a decreased urine output. In contrast to this methods of positive pressure maybe uh, other modalities such as uh, spontaneous breathing techniques could preserve renal functions such as the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, whether you resort to this uh, way or that. But uh, really, outcomes are not as one would think, and there's a lot of variability depending on the etiology of hypoxia and the severity of pulmonary disease, and naturally, the ECMO experience of an individual center. There has to be a, a, an individual who is practicing this, or you would face a lot of complications, as you can see depicted in this slide, such as bleeding stasis and microvascular obstruction. Therapies, we understand there's no specific therapy, yet early detection is always important. Uh, before the creatinine rises, because serum creatinine, once it rises, uh, we all understand that about 50% of the renal functions is already lost. So the best way is to find biomarkers and use what we have to detect the injury early. And the intensivist is uh, uh, left to deal with various facets of AKI, particularly in diagnosis and management that, uh, if dealt with earlier, could limit the extent uh, of injury and to ameliorate these effects we need to diagnose AKI early and limit the need for ventilation induced kidney injury as well as correcting the acid base balance and uh, to be uh, wise when using fluid intravenously not to push patients in volume overload and finally in conclusion fluid overload is a serious situation where the intensivist is forced to ask for a renal replacement therapy to get rid of this uh, fluid overload. The uremic toxins by far are so serious and injurious uh, to all the vessels of the body and particularly the lung with the associated inflammation and damps uh, that I have been talking about today. All of these factors have to be tackled together. Uh, I thank you all, and before I leave, I just want to make an announcement about our online fellowship in clinical transplantation. We have around 300 students now starting on module two. It's an online uh, type of uh, education, very updated, uh, does not uh, make any kind of burden on uh, the students because there's no specific time frame. Uh, if you are interested, there's a lot of links. Uh, maybe the organizers outside would have the links as well. And by that, I want to thank you all for your kind listening. And once more, I want to thank my good friend, Professor Amgad uh, Elbaz, for uh, giving me this great opportunity to be uh, here today. So thank you all uh, once more.